All right, campers. Uh, welcome back to day 10 of Maker Camp. Uh, today is uh, the last day of the Create the Future week, uh, and we've literally saved the best for last. Um, first off, uh, we're going to be speaking with the White House Office of uh, Science and Technology Policy and their Grand Asteroid Challenge. Hi there. How's it going, guys? Uh, let's see here. And we're also going to be visiting with NASA Ames and their space shop facility. Hi, guys. All right. And uh, we're joined by three of our, our, uh, our greatest counselors, uh, Kelly, Paloma, and Ibby. Say hello. Hi. 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 Guys. And uh, we're also going to be visiting with uh, NASA Ames and their space shop facility. Say, uh, let's say hi to the space shop facility if they are around. All right. Well, um, let's uh, let's start off with the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, your program? Well, hi. I'm Kristen Dorgalo, and I'm the Assistant Director for Grand Challenges at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. I'm actually here today at NASA headquarters, so I, I zoomed across town to sit here with Jen Gustetic, who is NASA's Prize and Challenge Program Executive. So we're going to talk a little bit about Grand Challenges today. What I do at, at the White House Office of Science and Tech is think about how we can work with the public to solve really hard problems that we think science and technology uh, could be brought to bear to address and things that the public would get really excited to solve. Um, we've launched grand challenges in all sorts of spaces. One of them was the President's Brain Initiative. And in that initiative, we're looking at building cool tools that will help us image the brain in a way that we can learn more about injuries from sports, we can help protect our soldiers, and we can help deal with diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So that's one of our grand challenges. Uh, some of our famous grand challenges in the past are grand challenges like the moonshot or sequencing the human genome. We think these big science and technology initiatives are super cool because they help the public work with the government to get big problems solved so that we can have a better and brighter future and also create some really cool jobs of the future. So that's what we're doing here with uh, grand challenges. Um, I thought maybe we could actually hear from President Obama a little bit, uh, tell us why grand challenges are so important. So uh, maybe we can throw to a video from President Obama. Right. That's why we're pursuing other grand challenges like making solar energy as cheap as coal, or making electric vehicles as affordable as the ones that run on gas. They're ambitious goals, but they're achievable. And we're encouraging companies and research universities and other organizations to get involved and help us make progress. So this is this, this idea that you know, we in the government need help from students, from researchers, and from companies to make sure we all solve these big problems and have a better, brighter future. So that's what we're doing over at White House OSTP. And NASA here with Jen has launched this amazing grand challenge related to asteroids that we wanted to talk a little bit more about. So on June 18th of this year, NASA announced uh, a grand challenge to find all asteroid threats to human populations and know what to do about them. And that's pretty grand. <laughs> that's a very, very big job, not just for um, the government, but our country and the world, and each and every one of you to try to help us figure out how we find these objects, how we characterize them, which means how we figure out what they're made of. Um, some of them can be rubble piles that look like a bunch of popcorn stuck together, all the way to really, really hard solid, uh, solid iron um, uh, asteroids. That depending on what they're made of depends on what they could be useful for and also how much of a threat to our own planet they are. So um, we care about asteroids at NASA for a variety of reasons. Um, an obvious one is sometimes they hit us here on planet Earth. Uh, you guys may remember back in February when uh, there was the explosion over Russia uh, with a small 17 meter sized uh, asteroid uh, that came in and, and you saw the dash cam uh, footage from uh, that day. Um, ironically, that was the same day that an asteroid uh, that we knew of, DA-14, was flying by relatively close by when this other one uh, took us by surprise. Um, but the reality is that asteroids not only sometimes hit us, 
but they also are really interesting from a resource perspective. You may have seen that there are several companies now that are looking into actually going to asteroids to use their resources from those asteroids. They're called asteroid miners, which I think is crazy. And super <laughs> cool. Um, so they're potentially a place for resources in our solar system, as well as we learn a lot about science, and we learn a lot about the origins of our own solar system from these objects as well. We actually have a mission to an asteroid. Uh, this is a 3D printed uh, version of the Bennu asteroid, which is a destination for our, our OSIRIS-REx mission, which will send um, uh, a spacecraft out to the asteroid to sample um, pieces of what we think to be the scientifically interesting asteroid to bring back those science, uh, those samples to Earth so that we can understand a bit more about the origins of the solar system, because these carry a lot of the materials from our past and from our origins. Um, and finally, uh, we care about asteroids because they're potential destinations for humans as well. Um, as you may have seen with NASA's recent announcement of the planning for an asteroid mission um, that would have us uh, go and find an asteroid and redirect that asteroid and then send uh, astronauts and our rocket and our capsule to go and explore it. So we care a lot about asteroids. We think they're really interesting, but the reality is that we don't know where all of them are. And uh, we issued this grand challenge, this national and global call, to try to get as many people involved as possible in finding, tracking, and characterizing these objects. And there are many ways in which students, entrepreneurs, companies, businesses, the media um, can get involved and help us do just that. So we're really, really excited to be working with the White House and OSTP and partners from across industry and the globe and thinking about how we all do this together because it really is a task for the world. Absolutely. It's a super, super important program. Um, so uh, I understand you have some, uh, some footage here to show us of the, uh, the program. Is that correct? Well, yeah. We just uh, looked at uh, actually uh, President Obama talking about grand challenges. And you know, Jen was talking about how more kids and uh, the public can get involved with helping us with these grand challenges. And I thought that maybe we should take a look at the White House Science Fair. Have any of you heard about the White House Science Fair? Yeah, yeah, we, we have, actually. Uh, I know super awesome Sylvia um, went there and I think showed off her watercolor bot. Exactly. So, yeah. She was there. And I heard, actually, there's a, a, a crowdfunding campaign for that watercolor bot now. So she's uh, making a business out of it. Yeah. We had winners from all sorts of uh, science uh, competitions from around the country come and hang out at the White House. We actually removed a bunch of furniture from the White House rooms and installed science setups. And the reason I thought we should check out that footage is that one of the fastest and best ways to get involved with solving grand challenges for kids is actually to think about getting a career in some training in science, engineering, technology, uh, big data science. We need all of those skill sets to work together. So when we held this White House Science Fair, I was blown away because I thought that all of those kids were already doing work that could help us solve grand challenges like energy and beyond. So maybe we can actually watch that footage and check out some of those cool science projects at the White House Science Fair. Sounds great. Welcome to the White House Science Fair. Uh, one of my favorite events during the course of the year. All of you are... Uh, you know, participants in this long line of inventors and creators uh, that Sylvia. have made this the most dynamic economy and the most dynamic country on earth. So seeing all the other uh, young scientists from across the nation is just like really, really awesome and inspiring to see that other people besides me care about this stuff. So. Well, I created this, this robotic arm that's controlled using your brain. So my project uses tactile sound to improve the experience of music for people with hearing loss. Uh, so essentially what I've created is a three-cent method to detect pancreatic cancer, ovarian cancer, and lung cancer. That takes five minutes. It's 100% accurate so far, but also you can detect the cancers in the earliest stages when someone has close to 100% chance of survival. I have the watercolor bot. It's a robot that paints with watercolors. It's really neat. So what I did is I created an artificial neural network, which is a type of program that actually models the brain's neurons and interconnections. So it can detect patterns that are far too complex for humans to detect. My work is on algae biofuels. So uh, the idea with algae biofuels is that algae actually produce these oils that can be converted into a fuel you can put straight into your diesel engine. My end-all goal is to create an affordable prosthetic for everyday use. Venture capitalists knocking on your door already? Actually, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. The science fair projects of today could become the products and businesses of tomorrow. Young people like these 
have to make you hopeful about the future of our country. I want to thank all the science fair winners, not only for the work that you guys are doing, but also the example that you're setting for your peers and also for your adults. We could not be prouder of you. All right, that's a, that sounds like a great program there. Um, it looks like we have a few questions from campers here. Cool. All right. Um, let's see here. Uh, Sam Reynolds has a question for you. Uh, when does the size of an asteroid become an issue to us here on planet Earth? So that's a great question. Um, the size of the asteroid, um, like I said, over Russia was about 17 meters. So you can see the type of damage that that size of asteroid um, did, which was largely blowing out some windows, um, luckily no deaths, but there were, there were many injuries and there was a lot of economic loss um, due to a 17 meter asteroid. When you start getting up to 30 meters, you're talking about having significant impact at the city size. When you get up to around 60 meters, you're talking about significant impact at a regional size, like the east coast of the United States. When you get up to about 140 meters, you're talking about entire continents. Uh, and when you get up to about 1,000, it's a really bad day for the planet. So we know, uh, the good news is, we know where 98% of all of those um, asteroids are that are, are bigger than a kilometer, and none of those are current um, threats to our planet. So the ones that were a bad day for the dinosaurs <laughs> are nowhere in our near future. So that's, that's very good. But that's good to hear. We're, uh, yeah, <laughs> very, very good. Good news. Sorry, kids. Um, the, the reason why we're really um, interested in amplifying detection through this grand challenge is because there's a lot at the 30 meter, 60 meter, and 140 meter level that we don't know where they are. And those are still potentially threats to the planet. So those are the ones that we're really interested in um, engaging people around the world in the quest to find, uh, track, and characterize. Understood, understood. All right, um, we have another question here. Uh, what kind of materials would you find on one of these asteroids floating around? So it depends. Um, there, are some, there are many, many what we could call space resources that could be found on asteroids. So there are some people um, that believe that you'd be able to extract things like water and maybe even fuel for, um, and, and make fuel off of the surface materials of some of these asteroids to power um, in-space missions. So you could imagine oh, harvesting wow. some of the materials from these asteroids and using those to create fuel that then cause you and allow you to go further um, into our solar system. Um, so you can find things like, uh, like those. You also find common elements like um, iron and other, um, other materials on the surface. A lot of the companies, the asteroid mining companies, are interested in some of the more precious metals that they think that they might be able to find um, on, on these um, bodies as well that are rare here on Earth, but we may be able to go and find more quantities of those things like platinum um, on asteroids that are out in the... Oh, whoops. Looks like we lost, uh, looks like we lost NASA there. Um, oh, here we go. We're back in business. Uh, <laughs> you were saying? Sorry, you lost us, but we were talking about those rare Earth uh, materials that we might be able to find on asteroids. Right. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so another question here from a camper. Uh, let's see. So you mentioned uh, that in, in capturing some of these asteroids, we might actually be able to tell us a little bit about our past. Um, can you kind of expand on that and, and tell us something? Yeah, so many scientists will say that the building blocks of the solar system are pretty similar uh, across the solar system. And so you'll find a lot of the same types of materials that you find on Earth on other bodies, whether that be comets or asteroids or other planets in our own solar system. And so, in fact, many people think that comets are what brought water to our own planet in the first place. And so we believe that asteroids that carry this historical record, just like comets and other other bodies, um, carry a historical record of the building blocks of our solar system, the primordial soup, if you will, of all of the materials that um, are used to make us and were used to make um, other other planets and other bodies in the solar system. So we um, are still learning a lot about this and a lot about the science there. So part of the reason for the OSIRIS-REx mission is to go and bring back some of these samples so that we can do tests here on Earth in our labs and understand the science there and um, our own connections to that primordial soup even better. 
Understood. Tell us more about what Osiris Rex is. What is Osiris Rex trying to do? So Osiris Rex is a mission that's going to be launching in about 2016. Um, and that will be a spacecraft that travels out. Um, it's going to take about two years to get there. Um, it's a long time um, to get to a lot of these destinations, actually. They're, they're pretty far out there, and asteroids continually move. They have their own orbit. So if we're here at one point and the asteroid's here at one point, in a moment, neither of us are going to be in those same spots because of the way things move around in the solar system. So it can take a long time for us to actually rendezvous with an asteroid, and our target asteroid it takes a couple years to get to. But once we get there... We're going to do some really close what's called proximity operations. So we're going to get really close to the surface of this thing and get really close and take pictures and understand better what it's made of and do work that's called, like I said, characterization of the asteroid to understand um, really, really what the best place is for us to identify to go in and grab some samples from. And we'll, we'll grab some samples from that and we'll bring those samples home and it'll be a couple year trip home. And then it'll come back and it'll land on the surface of the planet and we'll, we'll, we'll get to the real science on um, what that asteroid was carrying. It keeps going. We were just traveling along it for a few years and identifying it for a few years. Wow, that's so We impressive. have a question from a camper. Um, Sam Reynolds asks, since asteroids are so far, what makes them move towards Earth? Interesting. So um, there's a lot of... Um, I, I, so in, in our own solar system, uh, in astrodynamics and astrophysics, um, this is a good field to study if you guys are interested in the movement of objects in our own solar system. But um, our planets and a lot of other um, objects are influenced by the gravity not only of the sun, by the, but the gravity of the planets that are in our solar system. We're all rotating. We're all constantly moving. And these asteroids sometimes rotate... Um, uh, like in the asteroid belt, the main belt that you see just beyond um, Mars. And sometimes they're in these huge orbits that are going really, really far out into our solar system and then coming back. But they're all orbiting in some way around the sun. And so this is just naturally kind of how these bodies play with the gravities of these different planets and also our sun, which is the major influencer in our solar system. Um, there's lots of stuff moving around, um, not just the planets um, that are moving around in our solar system at any given time. And so sometimes those orbits will intersect, which right. we're hoping to avoid. Yes. So how do we detect asteroids, and how do we know which ones are going to be a possible threat to our planet? Great question there, Abby. Great question. So the way that we've been doing it mostly to date, there's a program within NASA called the Near Earth Observation Program that started getting funding in 1998. And they work with an international network of observatories around the world, a lot of them are universities, um, to, to fund ground-based observations. So what that means is there's these huge observatories, telescope observatories on the ground that are looking up at the night sky. And so they're usually in places that are super remote, get really dark at night so they can actually see the full sky and don't have as much light pollution as like you'd see in cities. And they are basically looking for small changes. Um, they're tracking moving objects in the plane that they're looking at. Um, uh, and whenever they think that they identify a new one, they immediately do follow-on observations. So look at it again to see if they can find it again, A, and B, if they can get enough point measurements on it to actually be able to calculate its trajectory, like where it's going, its orbit. There's a lot of physics involved in that, how you actually take measurements from three or so points um, that you see these things moving to, but you can calculate the orbit actually from those three points. And we mostly do it from ground-based detection at these big facilities that are um, funded in some way by NASA, but there's also a lot of citizen astronomers and what we call pro-ams, which are the semi-professional astronomers that have relatively big telescopes in their backyard that go out in their free time in their backyard and are making discoveries but more so doing follow-up observations, so they're tracking these things. They get like a, an alert when one has been detected and it needs to be tracked because it could be in our view right now, but then it's gone, mm -hmm. and it might not come back for a few more years. And if we weren't able to get a track on it, then we don't know if that's the same asteroid, new asteroid that we're seeing three years later as it was the one that we saw today. So follow-on observations are really, really important. And one more thing for the, the makers out there who are watching this, you know, some of these amazing amateur astronomers, they can make their own lenses and make their own telescopes 
And I've been able to be out in the desert looking through some of these telescopes, and it's amazing what you can see. So as you move up in your making ability, and if you're really interested in the stars and space and asteroids, homework assignment, figure out how to build a telescope, because the handmade ones are the coolest by far. Very cool. Okay, um, so for makers who are interested in, in potentially intercepting an asteroid in the future, uh, what would you recommend for them to, uh, to study or to, uh, to practice on? So do you want to start? Well, we talked about science, technology, engineering, and math, but I think it's really important to you know, go through all your basic science and tech courses, um, but there's lots of ways to contribute. So you might be an engineer who's thinking about the actual hardware involved, uh, but you might actually be an astrophysicist as well. Um, and you even talked about things like materials. You know, we talk about the importance of material science and helping to make uh, all of these things like telescopes, uh, the hardware we send into space, more effective, lighter weight, and cheaper. So there's lots of ways to contribute. Yep. Yep. Great. Then other ways from you? Science, technology, engineering, and math. Really <laughs> like STEM, we love it. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. All right. Well, um, Thank you for, for uh, taking the time out to uh, talk to us about your program, and um, the best of luck to you and, and all of humanity. Uh, hopefully your program <laughs> succeeds, which uh, it seems to be doing great. So we look forward to, to hearing more from you. Thanks for having us, and go Absolutely. Makers. Thank you. Yeah, go Makers. All right. <laughs> great. Thanks. Bye. Talk to you soon. Uh, so now we're, we're actually going to go ahead and hop over to uh, the space shop at NASA Ames. Hello there. Hi. Uh, I'm Matt Reyes at the, yep, in the NASA Ames Space Shop here in Silicon Valley. And uh, we're going to be showing off a couple projects uh, that we have got going on in here and just uh, talk about this uh, new fab lab that we've built here, the, our space shop that we've built for the workforce here at NASA Center. Right. Um, and here I have uh, our manager, uh, an MIT graduate, uh, Sarah Hosepian. Uh, she's a space shop manager, and she's just going to talk very briefly about what we're doing with the shop and uh, what, how the public can be uh, uh, involved. So welcome. Actually, I started here about six months ago. I graduated from MIT um, from Neil Gershenfeld's uh, Center for Bits and Atoms. His vision at MIT was to get one of every machine in one space, and that vision came true. And it's now known as the Media Lab, or the Mars Lab, so to speak. Um, now this Fab Lab network has uh, instantiated all over the world, and we here at Space Shop are using the same tools, tools such as laser cutters, uh, ShopBot, computer-controlled tools to, to make literally anything. So taking an idea and, and uh, creating a physical manifestation of that object, and we're empowering individuals to use the space shop um, to learn. And, and we're also training um, students and users here um, on all of these machines. So if you go to spaceshop.arc.nasa.gov, you can access under the Learn tab every tool uh, training manual uh, so that you can also use for your own machines. So, um, all this is online. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so the Fab Lab uh, Academy and uh, the effort of the space shop is to really get folks back into building things, back into rapid prototyping. And one of those things that we have here are small satellites. And so um, uh, Chris and Andy, actually, why don't you come here, Andy? Um, we, we've got some small satellites here on the table. And Chris, could you actually uh, talk to us about that? Yeah, so NASA Ames Research Center is essentially the leading center in um, small space traps. So what we have here is a CubeSat model. I don't know if you guys on the web can see this, but this is essentially a 10-centimeter cube satellite. This is a PhoneSat model. Uh, PhoneSat, if you're not familiar with, they're essentially launching a Google Nexus S phone in space uh, to do biological or to do basic communication test experiments. Um, NASA Ames has really done a lot of research in biological uh, tests, and so what we eventually would like to do is essentially make this system from a one specific system to a more modular system. So Andy can talk more about exactly the modular yeah. kinds of things. So this is a modular satellite, and the thing that's unique about it is is that it has no fasteners in it. The fasteners would typically be used on Earth, but if you wanted to build this in space, you want things that simply slide together as opposed to being screwed together. So in space, you actually have problems with uh, nuts and bolts and washers floating around. It's really hard to capture that in the microgravity, so this is something an astronaut can build. That's correct. Even turning a screwdriver can be a problem because it tends to turn the whole astronaut as right. opposed to turning the screw. And so this is something that's been 3D printed? 
this whole structure has been 3D printed. Even the circuit boards inside are 3D printed as a mock-up, but they could eventually be printed as a functional item. Now, these are pretty small satellites, uh, 10 centimeters cubed, and they can get a little bit bigger, but I understand we have some even smaller ones. Um, maybe Zach, actually, and Andy? Uh, so what you got here? This is a Sprite. Uh, this is the world's smallest satellite. It's about 3.5 by 3.5 centimeters, weighs a few grams, has uh, solar cells up here. Um, this chip's a microcontroller and a radio, and you can put your own sensors on here. It has a little antenna, and we're planning on launching uh, over 100 of these into low Earth orbit, and they'll be running excuse me, <coughs> a bunch of different experiments, and uh, you'll actually be able to pick up the signals from these in your own backyard with a couple hundred dollars worth of ham radio equipment. Now, you said uh, you can put sensors on here. Is it like an Arduino in a way? Yeah, the idea is to essentially create something like a space Arduino. Uh, this can be programmed just like an Arduino. You can plug it into your computer with a little board like this and uh, through your USB port and, and program it just like an Arduino. Oh, and, yeah. uh, um, and so how are these things going to be launched when they're in space? So Andy, you want to step in at this point? Sure. This is a 3D printed version of the launching satellite, and it has a series of ribs on it, and each one of these ribs would actually hold one of the chipsats, and here you can see one in place. So 128 of these would be deployed, and what's unique about it is, is that the antenna actually forms a little spring that pops it out, and that puts it into a spin that will keep it sun-facing and powered during its orbital life, which is two to six weeks. Oh, very, very cool. Okay, so so these are the smallest of the satellites so far, but these uh, cube sets that we have here have a lot of functions, and you can do a lot of science. And so, um, John, Dr. John Cumbers here uh, has some example of uh, some of the science that you can do in uh, in cube sets. So actually, and that actually looks like another 3D printed part. Yep, we've been using the Space Shop for rapid prototyping and 3D printing. Um, and this is a card by uh, one of our students, Aaron Berlina. And uh, we're making bioelectrochemical cells. So we're using the organism Schuonella onodensis, which you can see here on, a, uh, on an SEM image, a scanning electron microscope. And it's growing on this electrode. And we're using these for wastewater purification. So it's easier to show on this larger reactor, which we also 3D printed by uh, Beta Madresi in our lab. And uh, this is half a battery. So we put two of these together with a membrane in the middle. We have organisms on one side, wastewater going in. The organisms really like to metabolize the uh, carbon molecules in the wastewater mm -hmm. and produce electricity as a response. So these are 3D printed. Now, normally, this looks like it would be uh, it was a complicated glassware. Is that what it was? Yeah, these have been used for decades. And the original was a piece of blown glass, which we had custom manufactured and ah, cost a few so hundred. So that's quite expensive. A few hundred dollars for each one, and they're very fragile because they're made of glass. Mm -hmm. So we've started making them in the 3D printer um, and uh, to see if we can replicate them just for a dollar or so. Yeah, that's a, a beautiful use of taxpayer money. All right, thanks. Sure. Um, and so uh, to continue on high altitude biology experiments, um, uh, Dr. or to be, uh, yes. Diana Gentry, uh, <laughs> would, uh, you have some uh, interesting hardware here that looks like uh, we can talk about how it's made too. Sure. So this is a suborbital rocket payload, uh, partial build. So the science question that we were trying to answer is, uh, it's an open question as to whether life that's in the atmosphere is only stuff that's just picked up from Earth and then dropped down, or whether there's stuff that's resident in the atmosphere and goes through a complete life cycle. So this is a sampling payload that goes up and takes particulate samples, and we wanted to bring them back down and look for signs of activity, basically. Mm -hmm. Like so bacteria growing up high? Yes. OK. Um, so like in cloud it water or anything. And... Yeah. Got it, got it. So these are the filters that trap the particulates. These here are solenoid valves. And where did you get these? Looks like it could have been from the hardware store. Uh, you could find basically the same thing as at a hardware store. Or maybe these a Sparkline or something. Sure, yeah. yes, yes. A little... master. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you have the different filters. The valves can open and close, and that lets you take five different samples on one flight. And so these are electric valves, so you must be using a computer somewhere. Uh, yes. So after we did the suborbital flights, we retooled the payload for high-altitude balloons. And I have most of the control system for the balloon payload here. Um, this is basically a power splitting board, and this is the actual physical control for the valves. What's missing here is the uh, basically the dev board. And we started on a custom board, but mm -hmm. we actually ended up backporting it to an Arduino. Ah, so you could control this. So if somebody wanted to make this experiment using a high altitude balloon, which people do often, they can use an Arduino to actually control some kind of science experiments. Oh, yeah. It would be really cool if we could get kids to <laughs> launch balloons and give you some data. 
Um, but over here, we also have uh, uh, two students that are working on a, a biology project. Uh, we have Emily and Carl that are from the NASA Academy for Space Exploration, um, an education program I'm proud alumni of. And uh, they came over to the lab recently to um, rapid prototype some uh, hardware. So uh, Emily and Carl, could you take it away? Yeah, thanks, Matt. So we're here with a great summer program that brings together 12 students from across the globe to work on a group project. Now, a big problem in science right now is sending biological samples to space. It's really difficult. If Matt here is developing a neuromuscular junction, he wants to see the effects of microgravity, he'll have to build his own testing methods, his own hardware, and it's a lot of reinventing the wheel. And we want to make that process universal. So we're building a universal hardware that's capable of testing all sorts of biological samples on board the ISS to see the effects of microgravity. And it's customizable, which is really important, meaning you can give us muscle samples, bone samples, tissue samples. We can stretch and compress them, change the pH, the temperature, uh, control the flow of nutrients, and um, really make it accessible to all audiences. So in the end, we want to make sending your sample to the ISS as easy as sending it down the hall to a microscope. So this is looks like it's a 3D printer part. And Carl, is it, uh, did you help design that? Yeah, absolutely. So this we designed a few models in CAD. This is actually the first uh, iteration of our design that we actually decided to 3D print because we wanted to see how it all goes together. It's a very helpful process to see really what you're building and the actual end goal physically. So we designed this, and we decided that, well, there's some parts of it that we don't like. There's this part here on the end, which was originally had a purpose that we decided we don't need anymore. So on the new model, we've cut that out. And these small things turned out to be a little bit more finicky, than, so we made them bigger. And we also had this problem where this thing would turn. So we decided, you know, that's not good. Let's iterate and try again. So we have this model here, which also has the uh, uh, actuator, which is just a servo we got off That looks uh, like a line. servo from a model airplane. Yeah, absolutely. This is a very easily uh, purchasable off the internet, and it came here in a few days, and now we can actually integrate this with our system. The cool part about this was not necessarily that the fact that we built it, but 3D printing is awesome, don't get me wrong, but the best part about this is that this was designed on Tuesday, printed on Wednesday, and this was designed yesterday and printed this morning. Printed this morning, just and before the show. Exactly. And so now I've actually got my mind ways to redesign this because we've got some more issues that we need to fix, but it's slowly, it not, no, not slowly, very quickly coming along to be a full-fledged model that we can actually send into space. It's really exciting. And I love the psychedelic colors. I think Absolutely. Really I agree. Um, and so uh, we have two of our interns here for the NASA Ames Space Shop, and we have Eric and Diedrich, and they've been working on a number of projects with us on uh, uh, things that we're trying to repair, things that we're trying to understand how to build things and how to uh, make all of our sh machines uh, useful in a, in a consistent workflow. And so uh, one of the things here is uh, they're using the scanner to replicate or to simulate how to repair a part that may be broken in the field. So I'd love for uh, maybe you can explain a little more on what this is and what you're doing. Yeah, um, this is a, a scaled down model of the SOFIA um, telescope, which is the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. And it's this is a real um, scaled down model. So it, the actual um, telescope is in a 747 Boeing SP um, aircraft, and it's modified to carry a 2.5 meter, 17-ton um, <clears throat> uh, telescope to, uh, up to 35,000 between 35, 39,000 and 45,000 feet. So the, the high altitude uh, offers the you're getting above a lot of the air. Yeah. So that Telescope is going to be able to see infrared astronomy above yep. the noise of the atmosphere. But what I would love to know more about is like, what have you learned here, and, and what do you think you bring back home uh, uh, to Navajo, Navajo Technical College? Um, well, basically, what we've been doing is um, the model came with a few broken parts. So what we did is we went ahead and we pieced the parts back together and we scanned it, so we didn't have to start back from scratch. So that saved us a lot of time and basically money too. So all we have to do is now we have to get it into a 3D modeling um, software and just touch up the loose ends and you have yourself a 3D model. So, so during your visit here at NASA Ames, you're learning how to use the hardware, yeah. using how to make things when our laser cutter and our shop bot eventually and things like that, but also know how, knowing how to uh, create and even edit a design using the 3D software. Yep. And so do you see this being useful coming back home? Yeah, it's going to be real useful. Um, <clears throat> we can teach other students at our school how NASA works and their... Um, but also the just, skills of yeah, how the, to make yeah, things, exactly. repair things. And so just to reiterate, you're from Navajo Technical College, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. so uh, <laughs> there is a need 
uh, on reservation to yeah. be able to understand how to repair things and how to build things be self-sustainable exactly. in a very similar way that we might need uh, being an astronaut on station or right. if we explore uh, uh, Moon, Mars, or beyond. Exactly. So uh, uh, we're also learning these workflows. It's something very interesting. Yep. Cool. Yes. Thank you so much. No and then uh, uh, last but not least, we have uh, Made in Space. It's a 3D printer. Uh, that's being built for the space station, uh, founded by my friend and as former student of mine, uh, uh, Jason Dunn, and Eddie Gonzalez here. Um, please explain what you've got, what you brought. So what we have here is a 3D printer. It's the initial build of the 3D printer that will be going up to the International Space Station next year on the SpaceX. Um, so our goal is basically to provide kind of the platform that Space Shop has provided here is some way for groups like uh, the ones you just heard and individuals to iterate and build their projects, their experiments in space so they don't have to wait for the launch windows or even the opportunity to even get on a payload. And so what we have here is a bunch of parts that we've printed, um, such as uh, sample containers that take uh, you know, very little time to build in space. And so things like this could be used uh, for experiments like biology experiments to hold samples. Uh, you can build structures, you can build a 80 20, uh, you know, build little parts and then put them together like Legos. That's a lot cheaper way of making 80 20 than yeah, that's cool. <laughs> now, what's really interesting here is that you have a, a, a container that has an empty volume, it's a bottle. And this, if you had a lot of bottles, you put them on, on a rocket, you're going to run out of room. And so it seems like one of the things you can do is maybe email parts up, up to station and make larger volume things and save you know, rooms on rockets. Correct. So what we do would be send up this gray goo, just a block of uh, filament of feedstock of material, whatever it is, really compact, get it to the station. It's fed to the printer. And then when you want to build a much larger uh, object, like such a, as a bottle with a large empty volume or a big structure that's just going to take a lot of parts, that little package of gray goo then becomes this very intricate, yeah. very, uh, very useful tool. Very useful and, tool. And so that means you can pack more things onto a rocket, get more effectiveness up on station. Uh, this is an investment that you were awarded an SBIR from NASA, so I think this is something that certainly could save NASA money, it seems, right? And I really like the way you put it, Matt, that, um, that we're emailing hardware to space, and that's exactly what it is. And it's, it's kind of a, I mean, it's a new paradigm. It's a new way of thinking, the idea of literally emailing your hardware to space. Mm -hmm. Well, sweet. Uh, this is uh, uh, just some of the things that we have going on here at the uh, NASA Ames Space Shop. We have a lot of other opportunities for the public to get involved. As Sarah mentioned, we have spaceshop.arc.nasa.gov, which will show you some of uh, the instruction manuals, and eventually we'll, get, we'll be showing more progress on, on the uh, activities that we've been building in here. Um, and on top of that, you can reach out to me. I'm Motorbike Matt online or matthew.reyes at nasa.gov, and we can talk about uh, any kinds of projects that you'd like to try to participate in in some way, shape, or form. And so uh, with that, I'm willing to take some questions if we can. All right, great. Thanks, Matt. Um, let's see. I'll, I think I'll ask one question from uh, a camper, and I'll hand it off to our counselors here. Uh, Chris is asking a really great question. Uh, how do satellites uh, get repaired in space? And ah, is it, sat yeah. Go ahead. Okay, satellite repair in space. So uh, right now, oh, uh, we, we don't have that exact capability yet. Um, and Space Shuttle used to be able to go up and uh, repair some satellites that could capture. But um, as of right now, a lot of these satellites are designed to, well, to not break. But more importantly, a lot of the CubeSats that we were showing off, um, they are short lifespan, low Earth orbit objects that are designed to last for this limited period of time and then burn up so they don't get serviced. Um, and you would find that that would be, uh, 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 it's more useful to actually launch up replacements at a lower cost um, than it is to actually send a human up there or a robot to repair, especially these small size satellites. I see, I see. Uh, let's see here. Um, let's talk about that 3D printer. Uh, okay. What is what's the build volume on that? I mean, oh, the build what volume. What size prints can you can you make there? Sure. What kind of what's the build volume for the first prototype of the uh, main space printer? Yeah. So the the first printer is actually the one that flies on SpaceX five next year. is a It's a technology demonstration. We're working with NASA to really just kind of understand three D printing in in microgravity, and it doesn't really have a gigantic build volume. But right after that, we're sending a, another printer that actually is a permanent manufacturing facility for the space station, and that one's designed to have a build volume 
larger than a CubeSat size, so ah. larger than 10 centimeters on each side. You can imagine why. It's because we want to get to the point of what we were talking about earlier of actually building spacecraft on orbit. Uh, email and spacecraft, that would be good, yep. and have them tossed out the airlock. There you okay. go. Uh, we actually did that once. If you look up TechEdSat, there was a program that we had that was built here at NASA Ames Research Center that uh, was effectively uh, spring launched out, uh, out of an air airlock. So uh, another uh, program that was made by a bunch of students here at the center. That's great. Nice. Um, we also have another question about the 3D printer from a camper, and they're wondering how do you 3D print when there is no gravity up in space? Oh, so that's an interesting question. So if you actually pay closer attention to how some of these, uh, uh, the, the filament-based, the FDM 3D printers work, they're actually, you're, you're requiring an adhesion to the board. Um, and so that's why you may see perf board on some printers or the Kapton tri tape trick or the blue tape trick. You actually need to have the plastic lay down and stick to the board. And so in microgravity, um, you can still get that if you have your extrusion. But there are other things about printers that you have to build in space that are important, uh, uh, that more than just uh, how things stick down. Uh, so the, the made in space printer is something that's a, a little bit more special. And, and when you consider the safety factors that astronauts have to face, it's a lot more safe. OK. We have some more questions about the Sprite satellites. Uh, the um, Sprites, OK. Yeah, so what exactly is their purpose? So the question is, Zach and Andy, um, what is the purpose of the Sprite set? So um, right now, we have a launch coming up in December, by the way. But right now, at this point, uh, it's really a technology demonstration. Again, it's, uh, this is you know, at least a couple orders of magnitude smaller than anything else that's ever been flown in space before, at least deliberately flown in space before. Um, so right now, we're really trying to demonstrate that they survive, that they can be successfully deployed and launched into space, and that we can communicate with them from ground mm -hmm. stations. Um, eventually, the sort of things we want to do with these is, uh, I guess there's two main areas. One is um, we want to set this up as sort of a general purpose platform for really low cost space missions, so things that a high school class hobbyist ham radio uh, club could do, where you get a kit with one of these, and you get to put your own sensors on it and program it. So it's sort of this, this space Arduino idea. So eventually, we hope to get the cost for putting one of these in space below $1,000. So it's within the capabilities of, of clubs and amateurs and, and students. Um, the other side of that is, because these are so small and so cheap, you can afford to launch them by the hundreds or thousands. So that actually opens up a bunch of really uh, unique science applications. Um, things like distributed sensing in the upper atmosphere, things that you can't do right now with uh, large traditional spacecraft just because you don't have that many of them. So where right now you might get one or two measurements from traditional spacecraft, you can only have one satellite, say, for, the, for much less cost, you could deploy a thousand of these and let them spread out and get this 3D map and of a could, volume of space. In theory, or not actually in practice, you can let other people program these things if they have their own application with these clouds because they're such a program. Right, yeah, platform. you can have sort of a, a mix of different sensors on so, them. So if it's, and if it's based similar or actually on Arduino, if somebody wants to create their own science experiment, they can actually embed their own sensors and do what they want. Got it. Yep. So that's uh, uh, so the, the, the application for science in uh, with these seems to be what the end user wants to make of them. That's okay. Um, and you said that these last for about uh, two to six weeks. Uh, then what happens to them? Do you try to reclaim them at all, or do you just no? Load? <laughs> yeah. So what happens is when they get deployed. Um, they are so small that uh, the, the, and they're launched at such a lower altitude that they eventually are going to burn up into the atmosphere. So you wouldn't really be able to collect them back uh, once uh, they've been deployed. But they do transmit to the ground, so you'll be able to listen to them before they uh, before they re-enter. Okay. Gotcha. Another another question here from uh, from Camper Chris. He wants to know how much power is required to get a signal from one of these Sprite satellites. Oh, great one. How much power do you need to get a signal? How much power is transmit, and what do you need on the ground, the ground station? So um, the transmit power, so the power to the antenna is about 10 milliwatts, and they transmit at uh, around 437 megahertz. So that's in the 70 centimeter ham band. So what you need is a Yagi antenna, which uh, you know, a five or seven element Yagi, about yay big, and uh, those are available from a number of vendors online, from sort of ham radio supply kind of places, uh, for around $50. You need an antenna. You need something called an LNA, or a low noise amplifier. Again, available from ham radio kind of supply places from a number of different places. How much, how much do you think a ground station would cost? About uh, a 
couple hundred dollars. Uh, ah, so that's doable. Yeah. Schools could certainly do that. Sure, and it's the sort of thing, again, that's readily available from ham radio supply kind of places, Amazon, online. Um, basically, you need a laptop, an antenna, and, and uh, an LNA. You plug it into your laptop. We have a software-based uh, receiver for these, so it's actually a program you run on your laptop that actually decodes the signals. So you can uh, go out in your backyard with your laptop and your antenna, point into the sky, and, and see uh, you know, text being uh, received from these. Cool. They fly over. Cool. That's awesome. Great. Um, I have a question about your chip sats. Uh, you okay. mentioned that it's it's uh, it's got a microcontroller that's similar to an Arduino. Sure. So so um, you know what are the differences between your micro microcontroller and an Arduino, and how does that work? Okay. Um, I think that's a great one. Um, so Zach, they're they're really wanting to know is like what's the differences in the Arduino and uh, uh, between that and the standard Arduino board okay, and, the, so and the microprocessor. The microcontroller on here is actually um, the microcontroller is a uh, is actually a Texas Instruments MSP430. It's uh, a little different from the AVR on the Arduino, but um, We've worked on porting a uh, an Arduino style programming environment to this chip. Uh, it's a project called Energia, and it's on GitHub. And uh, basically, it's a port of the Arduino tool chain and, and the Arduino programming tools to the MSP430 core. So, um, using Energia, basically, you can program this the same way you would program an Arduino. The language is the same. The libraries are the same. And, and do you have? I think you have a GitHub for this project yep. as well. Yeah. Also, this. Uh, so the the name of this project, by the way. Uh, the, the project that we're uh, running right now, where we're, we're going to launch a bunch of these, is called Kicksat. We're online, uh, kicksat.net, and um, all of the design files and code for all this is open source, and it's also on GitHub. Wow, that's cool. great. Very cool. We had uh, another question in from um, online, and they were asking, why do things burn up in the atmosphere? Oh, why do things burn up in the atmosphere? Um, well, what's happening is if you imagine a rocket launching from a launch pad, extremely quickly to get off the ground and into orbit around the Earth. That high speed that it's going around the Earth, when it starts getting closer and closer to the atmosphere, if you can imagine as your hand would be outside of a window when you're driving really fast, um, that can, at the speeds that the rocket has pushed uh, these objects into space, that speed is going to create a tremendous amount of friction between the air and the uh, and the satellites or whatever it is that we enter, and that's what causes the streaks that you see, that big fireball, or sometimes just a shooting star. It's just that friction of speed against the density of the air as you get lower and lower and lower. Ooh, very cool. I have a question about the uh, the bio sampling. Uh, okay, what, the high what, altitude. Yeah, yeah. What kind okay. of bacteria are you capturing there? Oh, what kind of bacteria actually live up high in the altitude? Um, so you find a, actually a lot of fungal spores up there. You find um, some pigmented bacteria. Uh, extremophiles, if you know the term, are microbes that are specialized for living in really harsh environments, and you tend to find a lot of extremophiles that are very good at surviving in dry environments and in very cold environments and in irradiated environments because the upper atmosphere gets a lot more UV light than we do down here on the surface of the Earth. So that's what we're looking for. And so the things get carried up in the dust, uh, uh, is it uh, uh, something that's... How, how do they get up that high? Do we... Uh... Do we have any mechanisms for that? Um, a lot of it is dust. Um, surface water that evaporates carries mm. a lot of microbes. The oceans are actually a pretty uh, waves, good source. Action. Yeah, right. so and spray. Great, yeah. Um, soil, dust, things like that. There are lots of sources. And is it all over the planet? Yes. So at, no matter where you fire up a balloon, you're going to find these things? Yes. Oh, very so, okay, so you, you capture the bacteria and you're sampling it. Um, what does that tell us about, uh, you know, what is, what is the end goal of this, this particular uh, biosampling project? Ah, okay. So the question is, uh, what, what's the end goal? What is it that uh, ca capturing and collecting these bacteria tell us about, uh, about the environment? And, and how does it relate to space? <laughs> um, so one tie-in is the idea of planetary protection. So when we send things off of Earth, we want to be very aware of what forms of microbes from Earth we're taking with us. And so knowing what's likely to survive transport through the atmosphere or what a rocket might pick up as it passes through the atmosphere is very important. Um, there's also the question of 
does life go high enough that, in theory, it could actually be ejected from Earth's gravitational pull and be carried off farther into the solar system? We don't currently know if the natural processes on Earth are enough to occasionally pull life up that far. So those are the two things we're trying to answer. So it's possible that the bacteria floating around in space shows. Yeah. That's an interesting thought. <laughs> So are we worried about the type of bacteria that might be pulled back down by a rocket? Are we worried about the type of bacteria that might be pulled back down by the rocket? Um, it's always good to be very careful when you're dealing with organisms that you're taking out of one environment and putting in another. Uh, it's very unlikely that anything that thrives in an up upper atmosphere environment would survive being pulled down to Earth because of the temperature change and the pressure change and so everything like that. So they're at home in the upper atmosphere. When they come back down here, it's too hot or too moist or something. Yeah. It, Probably something else might be eating it, too. <laughs> Keeping it alive is, a, is actually a lot harder than you would think. Oh, so <laughs> even still, for your own sampling, it's hard to keep it alive. Uh, yeah. So you can do the analysis once you get back in. Yeah. Uh, so the Andromeda strain <laughs> remains to be fiction. We haven't found it yet. <laughs> cool. Very cool. I have a question about the, the 3D printer again. Um, Okay. What what kind of material are you using there? I know I know uh, it's it's a little bit different than a standard FDM printer, if I understand correctly. Ah, um, Jason, why don't you, uh, and Eddie, come here real quick. Um, the three D printer. What kind of plastic would you be printing objects? Ah, uh, good question. Yeah. Good question. So the first printer actually prints with the the common uh, thermoplastics that that we're used to seeing in all these other desktop 3D printers. We're actually developing new materials for, for our permanent facility that we talked about earlier. Um, the reason why is we need to develop basically a, a space grade uh, plastic that can be 3D printed. Something that can be used in the vacuum of space and, and you know be safe to use. So that's what we're working on. So we can make actual satellites flying out of plastic and not exactly. always metal. Yep. It's a lot easier yeah, exactly. to print plastic than it is in metal right now. Sure. Cool. Great. Okay. So that kind of leads into this uh, this other question here from Sam Reynolds. Uh, he'd like to know: Will three D printed satellites withstand conditions in space? Oh, there's a good question. Um, so three D will three D printed satellites uh, withstand conditions in space? Um, as of right now, uh, we don't really know. Um, we kind of have some hints. Uh, we know that the ABS plastic that we use uh, freezes all right. Um, we know that radiation doesn't do too much because we're also talking about a low lifetime uh, 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 orbits. So uh, radiation dosage is a function of time, so we don't need to worry about that. Um, where we really probably have trouble is um, in the vibration of rocket launch and in also in maintaining these high tolerances. If you envision the 3D printing is, leaves a rough surface sometimes, um, it, uh, there's some questions on that that we're, we're looking into. It's, a, it's something that's very interesting, and uh, uh, especially if you, if you want to take um, a satellite, an existing platform like the CubeSat, which is 10, 10, 10 centimeters, um, but if you, you could turn it the other way around and say, well, what if I just want to make a satellite any old shape? on station. You don't need it to be that 10 centimeter cubed uh, shape anymore. And so you could actually take any shape that you want as long as you have a way to safely deploy it from the station. You cannot have something uh, just thrown out the airlock because it could uh, end up hurting or damaging the station. So um, these are good questions that we're really just at the very beginning of starting to ask. Great, great. And I have one um, from one of our campers asking about the cost of 3D printing things versus setting them up in a rocket. Like, is it more cost effective to print things up there than it is to send them up? Sure. No. Um, so it, it, it depends. This may not be universally true. Uh, the question was, what's the cost difference of 3D printing something on station versus launching it? I think the, the big cost benefit is if you consider the 3D printing filament. It comes in a spool, it's a dense plastic, and it goes through the extruder to get smaller and create these volumes, that these volumes take up valuable space inside of the finite size of a rocket. And so you really want to pack as much as you can into a rocket. So if you can make containers of, uh, of for liquids uh, or for whatever, but a large volume containers using a 3D printer, you're going to save an enormous amount because uh, you, you'll be able to fit many more of these containers uh, per rocket, if you will, I per email. Yes? Add, um, it's, also, it's also time savings, right? Oh, true. It's, this is, it's all about you know saving the time to orbit, and especially when this printer's been designed as a um, a tool for the astronauts to use, just as much as it is a tool for building CubeSats. And when an astronaut needs a an emergency fix or a tool that they just don't have, 
it's really critical to get that there as quickly as possible. And with the, um, the amount of time that it takes to get that on a rocket, you know, we can print it much quicker. Great. Great. Uh, we've got another question here from uh, from Richard. Uh, he's wondering, what is the time delay between sending the signal and actually being able to view it on Earth? Um, the signal from uh, I'd imagine. I'd, yeah, I'd imagine the CubeSat. Okay, so the CubeSat signal, uh, actually, Chris, you might be able to answer this a little better. Um, the time delay uh, for uh, satellites, um, the communication back to the ground, it's, it can't be too much, or is that dependent on the orbit? Um, it kind of depends on the orbit, so it's uh, within a few milliseconds, so it just depends on where you are around the world. Uh, if you use an amateur ham radio beacon, it's a few milliseconds, so it's pretty instantaneous, and uh, for example, with Tech EdSat, uh, we got, I want to say around two, 2,000 packets from around the globe over the six-month time span, so it's pretty instantaneous, and we got a lot of data from it, so uh, we're just trying to research that and kind of do future Tech EdSat experiments off the International Space Station. So yeah, it's, it's pretty short. Cool. Okay. Pretty quick there. Okay, so what yeah. kind of data is the uh, the CubeSat collecting or searching for? Well, uh, the CubeSat, so the, the, the benefit of a CubeSat is that you have a standard size, right? You have a, a, a metal box that's uh, uh, 10 centimeters cubed, right? And you can pack anything you want. In, in fact, uh, there's a company that we are, uh, are working with. It's called NanoSatisfy. Um, and they have built these CubeSats out of, uh, uh, with, filled them up, I should say, with Arduinos, a bank of Arduinos that you can actually program while you're on orbit. And so that was just one application. Uh, you can see in the chipset design, the, the three. Actually, Zach, could you hold up the deployer? Um, you know, that's a three unit if you envision one, two, three. And uh, here, they just put the, the chipset deployment system in it. So the benefit of, of using a CubeSat is that you can put pretty much anything that you want. And, uh, and so to get back to answering the question, uh, it, it depends on what the mission was. And so from Tech EdSat, what that was doing was demonstrating low-cost technology. Um, and so uh, for PhoneSat, same thing. PhoneSat was a, a, a CubeSat that had a cell phone inside of it that we launched uh, a couple months ago now. And um, it was testing to see if a phone with the accelerometers and the sensors, um, the, uh, uh, with the, the equipment that you can buy for 500 bucks, right, um, or cheaper on eBay, if you could actually control a satellite with that. And so that was, uh, uh, again, a technology demonstration. But it depends on what, whatever the designer wants to put inside these uh, standard sizes. Gotcha. Okay, here's a, another quick question from, uh, from Camper Chris. He's wondering how you get the information from the satellite to Earth. So uh, what is it, RF? Is it, um, you know? It, it, yeah, it's um, a, mo these satellites operate in, uh, or many of these satellites operate, as Zach was pointing out, in the ham band. They're, so uh, ham radio operators can listen to them. Uh, I think that's the case for the chipsets. Uh, it's 70 centimeters? 70 centimeters. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, radio is uh, the typical way. Some satellites, you can actually talk to them by laser beams. You can actually shoot lasers up at them. But that's a little beyond the scope of what we're doing here in the space shop. So gotcha. you've mentioned before that like you can communicate with the satellites via like radio or like ham radio if you're an amateur. Um, so do you have mm -hmm. to program the satellite before you send it up, or could we have a radio and communicate with it now? Yes, <laughs> you can okay. do it both ways. Um, so for the uh, uh, it depends again on how it's set up. I, I do know that the uh, the ArduSat by uh, NanoSatisfy they do let you uplink uh, to the CubeSat and um, you can upload your own code uh, to the satellite. And so and they, we're working with them. We actually have a, a formal relationship with uh, that company and and hopefully we'll be uh, allowing people to program Arduino based satellites while they're in orbit so that not only do people understand Arduino programming, it's a real fun way of doing that, but it's also a way to pe teach people uh, uh, how to control satellites and all the mechanics. There's a lot of math that's going on uh, in being able to orient a, a satellite um, in, 3, in 3D, zero, in 3D microgravity space. That's super impressive. So that's an open source framework there, the, the, mm -hmm. the satellite. Okay. Um, Great, great. Yeah, yeah, the CubeSat is, is definitely open source, yeah. Okay. Is that made out of aluminum? Can we get a close-up uh, of This model that? is. Sure. Actually, how about we do this one? Um, this is definitely made of aluminum. 
Um, and uh, they have port entry spots. You can see that looked like a uh, USB port. In fact, actually, let me... Nope, I'll just use this one. Um, they come with uh, uh, switches. I can get it out. Uh, these little contact switches, uh, and here as well, if you can see, um, they uh, uh, tell the satellite uh, if they're still inside the launcher or if they're actually free-floating and, and stuff like that. But you can put any other sensors uh, that you want in here. Um, and, uh, yeah, this is actually sheet metal, um, whereas... Uh, where's the... Here it is. Um, these here, actually, this is not a flying model. This is just a concept prototype, but this is this is definitely 3D printed plastic. And just to highlight again, um, you know, these things you can take apart and assemble, uh, mm -hmm. kind of like computer cards. So, um, but yeah, the ones that we're flying now in space, they're all typically a, a, a metal. Understood. And what's the reasoning behind, uh, I guess, the size of that micro satellite? Why is it that particular dimension? The CubeSat. Yeah. Um, I think it, it was uh, uh, the the reason why they picked that. Uh, uh, I forget it was Bob Twiggs and who was the other? Jordy. Uh, uh, who's the last Cal name? Poly. Yeah. Cal no, Poly. Professor. It, yeah. The Cal Poly professors. <laughs> they developed the standard that everybody could use, uh, so that they were like, all right, we're just gonna make it 10, 10, 10. It's a convenient number and a convenient size, um, and it's actually a stressful size because now you really got to think, or at least at the time, you had to really how to think you're gonna pack everything in there. Still have to think hard about it, but um, the real cool thing is the um, the way the launchers are worked, uh, which I can explain differently here. Um, it, remember, I was mentioning that this is a uh, just, yeah. This is a three unit, one, two, three, which we have a lot of those. But we also have a standard that we're trying to develop, develop that is a six unit. So you can imagine three side by side, so six. Um, and so these uh, formats just make it easier for more people to participate in the development of spacecraft. <laughs> great, great. It, it, to try to reduce that cost because it's all about saving money. Understood. And uh, that okay, that's that's great. So um, let's talk about that 3D printer one more time because uh, okay. tr true camper true is asking uh, what are some types of things that the 3D printer would make. Oh, what are some types of things that the 3D printer could make uh, on station? So, sure. Just, so we'll uh, we can, we'll start with the uh, the printer that we're setting up next year. And like I said earlier, that's it's a technology demonstration. So it's it's where Main Space works with NASA to understand how 3D printing works in zero gravity. So in the beginning, we're testing uh, we're printing a lot of test coupons. We're printing um, columns that allow us to learn about the layer resolution and and samples that we can bring back to rip apart and figure out how strong they are. Right after that, though, we want to start proving that we can build useful stuff. And what Eddie has here are some some examples of that. I'll let him him talk. So about. right here, what we've been able to print with a 3D printer has been you know little clips that astronauts can put Velcro on, stick it to the side, and just hold on to you know pencils, papers, anything they're working with. Ideally, sample containers for any experiments they're running, or even for personal use, holding a little jewelry, little uh, nuts and bolts that they're using at the time. Uh, the more interesting one, the one I'm really excited about is actually being able to print out 8020 and build out uh, much larger structures than what the printer actually is capable of uh, printing due to the build volume. These you can fit easily inside the build volume and you print out little connector pieces and you just slide them right in and build you know, much, much larger uh, structures than the actual printer itself. So in the beginning we're, we're doing this, we're building parts that go inside the space station. The astronauts will use it to build the tools and the parts that they need to keep experiments going. And then uh, we're also enabling um, you know, engineers and entrepreneurs and students to build experiments that go to space and actually print most of that, ex that experiment there um, when they need it. And then one day we'll actually start printing the, the satellites like we've been talking about. That's cool. great. All right, um, so one thing that we're really huge on here at Make is tools. So um, ah. can you talk to us about the tools that are available at, uh, at the space shop? Oh, um, sure. Where's Sarah, too? We can, um, yeah, uh, we have a number of, of, of tools that you would find at uh, uh, the Fab Lab, the Fab Academy, uh, uh, if, you, if you just search that online. Um, these are tools that Neil Gershenfeld has put together as saying that um, we can to build almost anything as he teaches his uh, class. And so, Sarah, actually, um, can you explain each of the machines just real briefly what we have here as a, a build capability? Yes, yeah, so one room is the additive subtractive room. We have the bits from bytes 3D printer. We have the up 3D printer. We have a universal 150-watt laser cutter. 
Um, we have the wood shop, which has a basic suite of for, um, powered hand tools and a CNC shop bot. So that's a 7 by 10 foot shop bot where you can cut anything from foam to wood. Um, in this very room, we have uh, a sewing machine over there and a um, Next Engine scanner as well as a Connect scanner. And finally, in our electronics room, we have the vinyl cutter as well as the Modella desktop mill, uh, as well as uh, other capabilities for um, electronics and PCB fabrication. And can you explain real quick why a vinyl cutter would be in an electronics lab? A uh, vinyl cutter could be used for in, uh, in electronics because you can use uh, flexible copper uh, adhesives uh, and you can cut flexible circuits on that. So we have an example in there of a uh, 0.6 mil via that we can cut on on that. And I've actually uh, created a lot of things with that. They're not the most robust circuits, but you can use them for a few days and demonstrate a functioning circuit very quickly. That's great, Sarah. Thank you. Uh, so, Thanks. Matt, maybe we can talk to uh, the interns at the from the Navajo yeah, sure. Technical College. Um, you yeah. mentioned that they were using a scanner. Yes. Very so, cool. uh, Navajo Technical College interns, they want to know more about the scanner and, and yeah. what, what else about it. Uh, so, can we talk about you know uh, the actual piece of equipment and how it works and uh, what oh. you're you're using it for there? Sure, sure. So, um, Edric, why don't you explain exactly um, how the scanner works? What I'll do is I'll, I'll prop it so it's easier to see. In fact, I'll just unplug it there. <laughs> and then explain to everyone how the scanner works and how you're using it to um, uh, scan the uh, Sophia model. Well, first of all, it takes a 2D image, which is just a regular photograph. And then once it starts, once it gets a 2D image, it starts shooting out lasers, and the lasers would rotate and capture capture the the, um, the object. So where do the lasers come out? And right here. This is where the lasers come out. Okay. And then the camera's here. Say those are like eyes. Those yeah, pretty much. It's it's like an eye. It um it it um articulates that way um and then it captures the data and then it relays it back into the scanner and then from the scanner into the next engine software. Okay, great. So Matt, uh, theoretically, uh, say a piece of the spaceship broke. Could you mm -hmm. have a scanner on board, scan that and broken piece, and have it printed out? Um, okay, so the question is, is that um, if you had a scanner on board and something had broken, would you be able to print it out? Yeah, most definitely. Um, if it's broken, like I said, um, we have a part over there that was broken, and we pieced it back together. And we scanned it, so now all we have to do is get it in, in, into a 3D modeling software, and from there we can go ahead and start printing it, do a 3D print. Awesome. Yeah, and in this case, this is uh, you know a broken part from model, and it's it's actually it was really broken. It was a, a it dropped or something, but um, uh, this is a great analog. Uh, for um, kind of uh, repair that you would need to do on on station or, or anywhere really, if you think of a lot of NASA research is done in these far out regions of the Earth, um, if you had maybe not the next engine scanner, but you can imagine something that uh, little uh, if you broke the uh, the Xbox Connect, uh, people know about that uh, might be a little easier to pack and, and set up, and so. Um, uh, yeah, scanning and then bringing along whatever the machines that you need to do to make the part that uh, you've broken is definitely a valuable part of the workflow of how you use the shop, uh, like the Fab Lab or the Space Shop. Great, great. All right, well, uh, let's see here. Um, I think we'd like to now go on to asking you a little bit about uh, basically asking some advice. So. Um, for, for campers out there who are interested in, uh, in a, a technical career, uh, possibly working at the space shop there at NASA Ames, uh, what would you recommend to them? Well, um, right now, uh, what you can do is if you go to the nasa.gov website, you will find that there are a, a number of uh, education programs that are uh, described on the website that I would, I would say start with our website and then look at... Um, uh, uh, programs that would be available. Now, mind you, NASA Ames is in Silicon Valley here on the West Coast, but we have nine NASA centers. We have JPL we have, in so Southern California along with Dryden. We have Kennedy in Florida, uh, uh, Marshall Huntsville, Texas, JSC, Goddard in Maryland, Glenn in Ohio, and so on. Um, we, we, the, the other thing you can do is go to the local centers' websites, or even, you know, often they have visitor centers, and you can uh, learn more about the education opportunities that they offer in various ways. 
Um, the other thing that here in the space shop that we're trying to do, and, and we're not there yet, we have a little ways to go, but is understand how to share um, and, and learn from the public, how to get the, the maker public participating in the, uh, in the creation of, um, of hardware. I mean, citizen science is something that NASA has been very good at doing. And uh, uh, now we're, we're moving it up from, you know, software, for instance, uh, or software and some hardware, for instance, there's some challenges that... Um, a, a, a challenge program that's called uh, the International Space Apps Challenge. Um, there are other challenge programs uh, that are run by companies like Innocentive um, and the uh, uh, Top Coder and, and others. Um, and if you look up online uh, these NASA challenges, you'll find where there are opportunities. And I think the NASA RFI for um, asteroid the, uh, that uh, Jen Gusetic and Kristen Dorgello were talking about earlier are some opportunities that um, will eventually grow as well. All right. Great. So, Matt, um, how did you get started in, in this whole thing, and, and what inspired you to, to go down this path? Oh, um, it's a, uh, okay. So, uh, how did I get inspired to do all this? Um, it's a very long story, but it really, um, uh, the, 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 the short version of the story I like to share is that I had a neighbor um, who, <laughs> um, it was a dear friend of mine, it was a young, young child who had a whole bunch of Star Wars toys, and I came over to play, and I didn't have any Star Wars toys to play with, and so I brought over um, my other friend's space shuttle, and so we were playing with that, and I became uh, completely uh, infatuated with the space shuttle and learning more and more about NASA, and from there, um, I went to school to learn about uh, uh, how to do things in space and uh, ended up in a program here, like I said, the NASA Academy for, uh, at the time, is the NASA Academy, uh, Astrobiology Academy in 2000, so that was a little while ago, and, um, and ever since then I've always uh, uh, been involved in the space business and I've just uh, recently come, uh, well, in 2009 came back to Ames and uh, have been working on a number of education and, and workforce development programs. But I think the, the real point I'm getting at is that as a young child, I was caught. I was hooked. And it was, it was just a toy, but I was engaging with NASA, and I was taking advantage of the public, uh, all the information I could get in, uh, uh, in the public sphere, just from newspapers. I used to collect newspapers and, and all the sorts of clippings. And it was because NASA does such a good job of reaching out to the, um, the public. And so the one thing that I love about uh, the Maker Camp, uh, which I would have been completely consumed in if, uh, if that was around in my day, um, is that uh, uh, reaching out to the young kids, giving them something to do, giving them something to read and understand so that they're inspired and uh, excited about what opportunities uh, lie ahead of them. Absolutely. All right, Matt. Well, I think that's about all the time we have. Unfortunately, I would love to sit and chat with you, and I'm sure all the campers would love to ask a million different questions. Um, but I do appreciate your time, and uh, thank you for uh, showing us this, the space shop there. Hey, th thank you very much for this opportunity, and uh, thank you to Maker Camp for getting all this together. It's, uh, it's always fun to share what we're doing uh, at NASA. Great. All right. We'll be talking to you soon. Cheers. All right, campers. Well, um, that about wraps it up for the show. Uh, that was super entertaining. I, I think I have like 30 more questions here to ask, but uh, unfortunately, we've got we've to close it up. So um, let's see. What's next here? We've got Radio Shack Weekend Projects coming up, uh, and uh, it's hosted by Nick Raymond. Uh, we've got a really, really cool project there. So uh, let's, let's hand it off to him. We'll see you guys tomorrow. All right, hey there, campers, and welcome to week two of Maker Camp's weekend projects powered by Radio Shack. So, for this week's theme, it was uh, create the future. So we thought we'd bring you a project that uses some pretty basic materials with some pretty high-tech components to build a project that we like to call the touchless 3D tracking interface. So the way it works is we'll be cutting out uh, some cardboard panels, and yes, this is tin foil, uh, just glued on top of these cardboard squares. We'll make three of these total. Uh, they'll act as uh, capacitive panels that we'll then put into a uh, half cube shape, kind of like this, and use as a 3D tracking sensor uh, for our hands position. Uh, to do that, we'll also need the use of an Arduino Uno microcontroller that will be taking the basically the, the information from these panels. Uh, you'll also need about six feet of shielded wire. Uh, this is coaxial shielded wire. Uh, you can find that most kind of uh, audio cords or cables just cut the tops off. Additionally, 
You'll need three alligator clips. Uh, these are handy because they come in different colors, so you can identify the different connections that you're making to the specific pins on the Arduino. Uh, you'll also need six uh, resistors, and we'll show you their values and the wiring schematic in the video after this Hangout, as well as a small piece of solid core wire. Um, I recommend the solid core wire particularly because this connection will be going directly into the 5 volt pin connection on the Arduino Uno. And so if you use the, the 24 gauge wire, it'll fit right in there no problem. Uh, additionally, let's see what else. For the materials, uh, that's pretty much it. And then the tools, uh, you'll definitely want a soldering iron for this project, as well as the wire strippers and the wire cutters to make those connections for the coaxial cable. Uh, if you want, you can always put this project into one of these plastic enclosure boxes. Um, it'll look like this at the end. This is one way you can do it. Um, you can always mount the Arduino to the box using these standoffs and um, drill a hole with a rubber um, grommet at the end for the cables. Um, to do that, you'll want to grab a Dremel tool to make this nice square opening for the USB cable to program the Arduino. And you can always use a drill bit to drill these holes out for the uh, mounting holes and the wires. If you uh, think you're going to be working on more of these projects in the future or working with these kind of plastic project enclosure boxes, I would highly recommend, if you can, go out and grab one of these uh, step drill bits. These are great because if you don't know the exact size of the hole you need to make, you can pretty precisely and accurately go up sequentially in size. Uh, these go up in one eighth inch, in one eighth inch increments. Uh, fits right into the chuck of any drill. And um, really, really good at cutting through plastic wood. And I've even cut stainless steel with this bit in particular. Um, that's it as far as the tools go. Uh, you'll also need a laptop or some kind of computer for this project. Uh, we will be interfacing the Arduino with that computer. It could be uh, Mac or Windows based. Uh, so you'll need to go download the Arduino IZE programming software. We provide the Arduino code for you. You can just download it and uh, upload it to the Arduino board. And then you'll also need a second program. It's called Processing, and that's also free. And that's to run the code that has the visual uh, interpretation um, that reads the data from the Arduino and then makes this kind of visual picture that shows where our hand is in a, in a virtual space. Um, let me show you actually now what uh, all this stuff looks like once we build it and put it together. And I'll also show you what the programming um, environment looks like when we're running the actual simulation. So let me just click on those. OK, so here's an image of what our project will look like uh, when it's all finally assembled and built. Um, you can see there's a, in combination with the Arduino and you know, a few uh, resistors and some wires and the alligator clips, uh, we're going to turn this sort of half cube looking thing uh, into a virtual reality interface. Uh, and so uh, physically, it's a bunch of cardboard and some tinfoil. Uh, and then we're using the capacitive nature um, to be able to do something kind of like this. Let me switch over to the next slide um, here. And yeah, so this slide will show you what it looks like from the processing interface, um, so like the, the virtual reality of it. So you can see as your hand sort of moves around in the, in the space defined by the half cube, um, that yellow ball sort of thing uh, will float around and represent where your hand is. And then as you move the hand in a specific region of the, of the cube, um, the different boxes will light up and turn red. So um, that's just an example of this sort of tic-tac-toe game. You could play um, some of the code that's provided that you then implement using processing. OK, what's going on here, and how does it work? So we'll start with the cardboard squares. Uh, we use the cardboard as a backing plate, and then we add the tin foil on top using the adhesive or tape. And the tin foil is used to create a capacitor. So we have three of these because we want to be able to measure the displacement of our hand in both the x, y, and z axes, or measured you know, up, down, left, right, forward, backwards. Uh, and we also make sure that tinfoil doesn't go to the exterior edges of the squares, because when we put them all together in that cube shape, we don't want them to touch and short circuit. Uh, so remember that. Uh, and then we have the Arduino. So as the Arduino is hooked up to each of the plates, it's providing a voltage and a current, but it's also measuring the resistance in each of those plates. So as we put our hand somewhere in that defined space, we're interfering with the electric field 
and the resistance on those panels changes. So that reading is sent to the Arduino. Uh, it computes it and gives it to the processing program, which then interprets it and correlates that to a three-dimensional space in our program somewhere. And then it's you know, displayed on our computer screen. Uh, this is only possible because the human body is able to conduct and resist electricity. So as we're interfering with the, the cube space and, and the capacitors, you know, those values are changing. And that's picked up by the Arduino. All right, so let's see what else can we show you. Well, you know, now that we showed you how it kind of works and um, some of the parts and materials that you'll need, let's go ahead and we'll show you the weekend project video for the touchless 3D interface. Um, have a great weekend, everybody, and we'll see you next week here on MakerCamp, and enjoy the video. Hi, I'm Nick with Make. For this weekend project, we're going to use simple materials to make something rather amazing. A 3D computer interface made of cardboard and aluminum foil that can track the position of your hand. I know it sounds crazy, but you've really got to check this project out. Here's the finished project in action. As you move your hand through the sensor cube, the colored sphere follows along on the screen. Impossible, you say? Here's how it works. Each plate acts like a capacitor that can store a charge when a voltage is applied to it. Each plate is attached to a different pin on the Arduino, which provides the voltage and current to charge the plate. As your hand approaches the plate, your body electrically couples with the plate and changes its capacitance. The higher the capacitance, the longer it will take for the plate to fully charge. The software on the Arduino measures the time it takes for the plate to charge. The change in the charge time corresponds to the hand's distance from the plate. By adding a plate for each dimension and measuring them in turn, we can establish the hand's position in three dimensions. You will need the following parts for this build. You will also need and these tools. Start with three cardboard squares, about 12 inches square. Attach three similar sized pieces of aluminum foil to one side of each square with spray glue or glue stick. Work slowly and make sure to leave a small gap around the edge of the foil. It is important that the foil plates do not touch each other when we tape the three sides together. Using tape, assemble the plates to form one half of a cube. Next, we need to prepare the wiring. It is important to use shielded wiring so that the cable itself doesn't act as an antenna and skew your sensor readings. Cut the wire into three two-foot lengths. Strip off the outer and inner insulation. On one end, trim the shielding wire and connect just the inner signal wire to an alligator clip. Repeat for each length of wire. On the other non-alligator clipped end of the cables, twist the three shield wires and solder them together. The shield will be connected to the five volt pin on the Arduino, which will minimize the antenna effect of the cable on the circuit. As shown in this schematic, each plate connects to an Arduino pin through a 10K resistor. In addition, each plate will have a 220K pull-up resistor. In turn, each plate will be charged and then discharged through these resistors. Twist connect a 10K resistor to the inner signal wire of each cable as shown. Then twist connect a 220K resistor to each signal wire and solder both resistors to each wire. Twist and then solder the three 220K resistors together, then solder a piece of jumper wire from the shield wire to these resistors. Then add a second jumper wire from this junction. The wires are now ready to connect to the Arduino. Connect the three 10K resistors to pins 8, 9, and 10. Connect the jumper wire to the 5 volt pin on the Arduino. Attach each of the alligator clips to a foil plate. The clips should be attached in the following order. Pin 8 to the left or X plate, pin 9 to the bottom or Y plate, and pin 10 to the right or Z plate. Make sure that each clip is making good electrical contact with the foil and is only touching one plate. Now the sensor cube is ready and all you need to do is upload the Arduino sketch. Download the Arduino and processing sketches from the how-to on Make Projects. 
You'll also need the processing and Arduino development environments, which can be downloaded from their respective websites. From the Arduino IDE, upload the sketch to the Arduino. Keep the USB cable connected to the Arduino, then install and load the processing sketch. It is important that the Arduino is properly grounded for this to work properly. Make sure your computer is plugged into the wall, not running on battery. The next thing to be done is calibrate the software. With the processing sketch running, hold down the left mouse button. Then move your hand from the far outer diagonal corner to the inner corner. Don't touch the foil, just move your hand through the space defined by the cube. Now release the mouse button. The path your hand traveled gives the software a chance to detect the range of motion your hand will make inside the cube. Now everything should be set. As you move your hand around inside the cube, the sphere should follow your movement. This project shows you one way you can use a microcontroller to turn very simple materials into capacitive sensors. The same techniques can be used to make your own touchscreens or turn pennies into switches. Try it, and you'll see how a simple idea can yield surprising results.